it's a gorgeous evening, so we're going to do some mealworm Q&A outside tonight. Uh, today's question, uh, Aaron, this one's for you. Uh, question was posed to a group of folks uh, in the insect world uh, about challenges for scaling up um, insect production, uh, mealworm production. So I'm going to speak from my perspective and my experience uh, as a micro mealworm farm. I consider myself micro from an insect or an, an industry perspective. Uh, I run a 2,100 square foot mealworm farm uh, that sells live feeders, uh, live mealworms. I ship those out every Monday, except for holidays like today. Uh, shipping will happen tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, and a few topics uh, that I wanted to touch on um, that were specifically asked for diet preparation, rearing, breeding, uh, and feedstock control are the ones I'll touch on. Um, diet preparation and feedstock control. Um, that's one of the things that, like from a scaling up perspective, that is a, an issue I am having right now. Um, so from a control perspective, uh, I don't have control. Uh, I buy wheat bran from a supplier that makes it however they want to. Uh, and so... I don't have a big enough operation to be able to um, buy that stuff from a supplier and get it made tailored specific for insects. So I just kind of get what I get from a wheat brand perspective. Um, knock on wood, so far I haven't had too many issues. Uh, the main problem I run into is that there are bugs and eggs of bugs in there that I don't want uh, that aren't good from a meal and farming perspective. So weevils, uh, pantry moths, stuff like that. And so what I have to do is treat that somehow. So the method I've used so far is to deep freeze it for uh, 48 hours at zero degrees Fahrenheit, minimum of 48 hours. Uh, and that has worked very well uh, for the last several years. I'm running into a pinch point now, though, where I can't freeze enough bran fast enough to keep up with the production in the farm. Uh, things have ramped up. Uh, I've got things running smoother. Uh, and there's a couple more changes that I'm going to implement that will increase production even more in that 2,100 square foot uh, space. And so I'm going to crank through wheat bran even faster. And so I need to look at alternative options um, because one of the things you have to deal with from a scale perspective um, and from a, a production increase perspective is the impact on the footprint that you're in. I can't expand my current building. Uh, and so all I can do is think about how to maximize the space that I have. And unfortunately, to increase the um, volume of wheat bran that's been uh, through that deep freeze process, I have to increase the number of deep freezers I have, which steals floor space from the building uh, and essentially takes production space, right? Because every square foot that I can't put a tray or a stack of mealworms uh, is lost production. And so one of the things I'm looking at uh, is the entoleader, um, I believe it's called. Uh, been a long weekend and it's late in the evening so um, I just started research on it uh, but basically what it does is it grinds and pulverizes and kills and crushes anything that's in the substrate passing through it the problem I run into uh, is finding an insect farm that has used one and is willing to talk about it to be able to, to answer questions like how much volume can it put through it what issues did you run into from a production perspective once you started using something that went through that device versus just standard substrate? Um, what floor space do you need to operate it? Uh, is it something that has to be secured or can it, can it be mobile somehow so I can tuck it away in a corner and pull it out when I need it? Um, how do I feed it? Do I need it connected to something large and robust, industrious, uh, industrial, or do I need to, you know, can I just build a simple hopper that I pour into, that sort of thing. Um, how quickly does it work? Like all these questions that when I reach out to these companies in, in situations like this in the past and say, hey, I run a meal on farm, I'm curious about how this is going to work for XYZ, they immediately say, we don't know, we have no idea, sorry. Um, and I don't blame them. Uh, but that's an issue that we run into uh, in the mealworm world is that the folks that have machinery or tools or things that might work for us have no clue if they will or not. And that, that's normal. Like I, I don't fault any of those companies. There's no need for them to know because the demand right now in the U.S. For, for people like me to try to get this stuff is very low. Um, and so that's the, the 
issue I have from a scaling up perspective is that what I'm going to run into is the risk of buying one of these things, not realizing some key aspect of it, uh, and then finding out after the fact. Uh, a good example of something that I can think of would be if you feed wheat bran through this machine, uh, it pulverizes it. Uh, is it going to grind it up uh, to where instead of the flaky um, you know, wheat bran texture that they eat uh, and that I have you know, known results from and known procedures and known impacts and sifting from, uh, is it going to change that texture or that process somehow to where like that wheat bran becomes a finer particulate? Is that going to be better for the mealworm, for the larva to eat in? Is it going to be bad for the beetles because it's going to be potentially, um, you know, like heavier, uh, more compact, like a flower? Um, these are all things that until I use the device and get the output from it, I'm not going to know. Uh, and on top of that, I won't know until I put it into the system uh, and go several months, right, to get a couple cycles uh, of uh, beetles laying eggs, eggs to larva, larva to pupa, pupa to beetles, and then rinse repeat just to make sure that it's getting consistent results from whatever's happening. Um, so that's a, a good example of like from a scaling perspective. Uh, you run into things that are going to potentially drastically impact your processes, but also just the colony in general. And you're not going to know until you do it. Um, and so that's, that's been one of my biggest challenges is just not knowing what's going to happen, positive or negative. <clears throat> um, from a, a rearing and breeding perspective, um, I haven't tracked much of that uh, from a, not from a quality perspective, but from an improvement perspective. Uh, the last couple of years in the building I'm in has been to really maximize the space, get more trays in there, get more production, uh, get consistent with what I'm doing, um, and then start tinkering. And so, uh, from a, a breeding rearing perspective, uh, you start looking at things like, um, introduction of new genetics, new genetics. Uh, hoping that what you find out there is going to be different than what you have. Um, and then there's always the pot potential when that happens that you bring in some sort of uh, either pathogen or insect. Uh, a lot of producers will use, um, what are they called? Sorry, it'll come to me, like lesser, lesser mealworms, dermistid beetles, um, things that eat dead material. Uh, they use it as a control for not having dead stuff, but in return, what you get is these other insects in your mealworms. Uh, and so you have to have, have a quarantine process uh, in place so that anything that might come with eggs in it, that's, that stuff all gets hatched out and gets taken care of, doesn't get into, the, into your mealworm colony. Um, I haven't noticed a big issue with not introducing genetics. Um, but that being said, the colony is still pretty young. And so what I'm starting to move forward with now that I have a good consistent process, once you know your baselines of things, then you, then you can start tinkering. And one of the things I'm going to tinker with is uh, adjusting the reintroduction of larva into the colony after they've been harvested so that the smaller larva, the first time that they get harvested, first time a tray gets harvested, uh, there's some smaller larva in there. Those larvae probably need to go. They're growing slow. Um, they're not growing as fast as the other ones. And so from a breeding stock perspective um, or from a rearing perspective you know, to improve the, the colony and to improve the output, uh, those smaller ones could probably go. Um, so I'm just getting to that point of starting things like that. Uh, but up until now, it's been very much just get in a rhythm with things, document and track uh, inputs, outputs, um, you know, picking data points that are meaningful. Um, from an operational reality. Uh, for example, I have a lot of people that ask me, you know, from a, a reading perspective, how do you make sure that you have the right balance of male to female uh, beetles in the tray? I don't. Um, th there's not an efficient way for me to sex those beetles at the scale that I'm at. Um, and really, I haven't had a need to. Uh, I put a number of beetles in the trays and uh, the output from those has been working. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into it just the, just from a, just the, sorry, there's a lot more that's going to go into that than just picking male and female. What's the right ratio? 
50-50, 70-30, right? So even if you could select it, then you have to go down this path of what is actually the most efficient. Um, and what I found is that the most efficient uh, is whatever works best for the operation that's running. Uh, I've read a lot of research articles, a lot of, read a lot of papers, and had a lot of feedback from people. And when I ask a lot of why questions, um, there's very generic answers. Uh, why did you do this? Or why do you think that was happening? Um, or, uh, you know, introduce some additional variables that could have caused the outcomes they're getting. Um, what I find from the research papers is that taking what, what happens in a lab and applying that to an operating colony uh, isn't realistic. I don't see the same results. I don't, don't see the same uh, impacts. Um, and so I think that the literature from a research perspective needs to be taken with a grain of salt if your goal is to run an operating colony from a business perspective. Um, because the, the things you're going to have to do, um, you know, like, for example, it's a holiday weekend for me right now. Uh, it's a Monday today. I should have been in the farm and hydrating. I chose to take today off and not go, to, go over there and do that. Uh, and so... The mealworms will go an extra day without being hydrated, which uh, in theory means that they aren't going to grow as fast as they would have if they had their hydration on their routine schedule. Um, but that's the reality of the business that I want to run, right? And so there's, there's optimal and there's realistic. Uh, and I think those two things can marry as long as you can accept those and not try to strive for unrealistic expectations. Um, I'll probably wrap it up there. Uh, I'm already up at, at 12 minutes now. Uh, if you have any questions, leave those in the comments. Reach out to me, uh, Justin at MidwestMealworms.com. Um, but it's starting to get dark and uh, probably time to wrap it up. Thank you much.